Well, I started a, a new series of messages last week, and uh, it's called It's All About We. We're in a theme this year for the entire year called On Mission, and what we learned is this, that we can do more together. In fact, that's why we have the church, because we are to work together to help bring change in people's hearts, therefore bringing change into the world. We can do more together. This isn't just uh, something that we hear about in the church. We know this is a common theme in our society today. In fact, they've given a name to it. And I began talking about that last week. It's called synergy. So on your outline sheet, I want you to take a look at that word again. And the word synergy basically just means this, a total effect that is greater than the sum of the individual contributions. In other words, when we come together, we can do more. That's just a secular way in which saying, uh, saying the same thing. But for us to do it, there's some things that have to be true. One is that we're all going in the same direction. And the other thing is that we're strong, individually that we're strong. In fact, when we're strong, when we're strong in our belief and we're strong in our passions, we begin to come together and begin to make a difference in this world. It's called momentum. Don't you love momentum, right? I mean, we look on the field and the football field, and of course, the University of Alabama usually has it over most op opponents, right? You don't care. Um, some of you love other people, and you say, yeah, I remember that. They got killed in the end. And what happens is we lose momentum. Some people look at people and say, hey, man, they're great. They're great. They do this. They do this. Do this every week. But when it comes to the end, if you lose momentum, you lose, right? You lose. And what causes us to lose it? Because we get our mind and our attention off of things where they should be. Our attitude begins to change. And that's what I talked to you about last week, and I want to continue doing that today. I shared with you a couple of attitudes that we're supposed to have, and we're going to move through a couple of more today. On your outline sheet, there are like eight, and we won't make it through all of that, so there's hope for you, all right? So as we go through it, don't think that we're going to um, be here all day long doing that. It is about attitude. Look at the uh, look at the definition of the word attitude on your sheet once again. It says this. It's a manner, disposition, feeling, or orientation, especially of the mind, that what we think changes our attitude. And this is what we know is that uh, for believers, Satan doesn't want us to have a good attitude. Voltaire uh, made this statement. He said, the most important decision you can make each day is to choose to have a good attitude. Isn't that a great statement? that we are to choose to have a good attitude. We are to choose that within our mind. But Satan doesn't want us to have that good attitude. So he allows experiences to come into our lives that cause us to be distracted. Last Sunday on the way to church, uh, Jennifer and I had one of those experiences because uh, we drove two, two cars, separate cars. We normally don't do that. And we did that because Jennifer was going to stay here and get ready for VBS and do some preparation well, on the way to church, I'd driven, left a few minutes earlier, uh, on the way to church, I was about five or ten minutes away, and then I get a phone call, and Jennifer says, I'm, on this, I'm, I'm in a parking lot on this side of the road, something's wrong with the car, I've got a flat tire. And immediately, I got out of my car, got on my knees, and I said, thank you, God, for the opportunity to bless my wife today, right? No way. I mean, you're in a hurry, you're wanting to go do this, you want to do whatever, and all of a sudden it's like, oh man, I needed to get to church at this time, and there's this frustration. But what are we supposed to do to still have the good attitude? Of course, God brought my attention to the sermon title for the day, and immediately it caused me to remember, you know what? I do have an opportunity to bless my wife today. I do have a, a time that I can uh, do this to help her out in a time of struggle. And that's the way it's supposed to be for us. We're to have that same attitude all the time. So the question is, uh, do we have that? And, and we hear the statement that people have, what, dude, what's up, the, what's up with the attitude? You heard people say that before? Some people, some people may have said that to you before. People have said that to me before because it's not the good attitude. It's something negative that's going on. But people really should be able to say that same statement to us in a positive way. Hey, man, what's... What's up with the attitude that you have? I mean, in a great way of like, man, there's something going on with you that's causing you to be in a good mood, that's causing you to be different. What's up with that? How can I have that? Well, it all begins with our mind and what we think. We just heard that in the definition of the word just a minute ago. It's about what we think. 
And what I want to do is just to remind you what we learned again last week, that what we think in our mind causes us to either have that good or bad attitude. In fact, I talked to you about it in this way. They're the considerations that we have in our mind. So what do we consider? What are we supposed to be thinking about? Well, there are two. One is it's the consideration of dignity, and the other one is of identity. Dignity says this. It asks the question, what am I worth? So all of us have that question. What is my value? What am I worth? Because if you don't feel like you're valuable, if you don't feel like you can make any difference, if you feel like you don't matter, you'll have a bad attitude. It changes your attitude. But if you're a person who says, I am of worth, I am a person who's created by God, I am a person who can make a difference, then you'll have a good attitude because you'll know that about God. You have dignity because you understand that there is value. And then there's that second thing about identity. And it asks this question, who am I? Who am I? You know, a lot of people reverse these two questions. They say, who am I first instead of what am I worth? But you know what? You have to ask the first question, who or, or what am I worth? You have to do that first because when I know that I'm of worth, then I know that God created me uniquely in the way he did for a reason. That's who I am. I'm created for a reason. We look at ourselves and we see that we're made up of many different things. We have different personalities, we have different abilities, and we have even different motivations. And the motivation is not getting us off track. Obviously, we're all supposed to lead people to love God and to love other people, but we have different passions in how it is that we do that, and that causes me to be unique in who I am. If I see that God caused me to be this way, I can grasp it and be excited about it. But if I look at my life and measure my life according to other people's personalities, man, I wish I had their personality, other people's abilities and what they've accomplished, other people's motivations and their passions in life, I'm going to have a bad attitude. Isn't this the place to start? I mean, if I've got a bad attitude, first of all, I need to think, well, do I really see myself as valuable by God? And am I measuring myself according to other people or according to who he wants me to be? That's where it all starts. Well, Jesus knew the importance of this, obviously. As a matter of fact, Jesus knew for us to impact the world that we all had to have the right attitudes. I didn't say attitude, I said attitudes. He wanted to teach the disciples this very thing because it was the disciples that would begin sharing this message and because they as a group did it and had the same message and were strong in their faith, something happened. It's called synergy, right? The results began to be multiplied and multiplied, and there were greater results because of what they were doing. But what Jesus wanted them to know is, for that to happen, this is how you have to be. So let me just set up uh, the story that I'm about to share with you and the words that Jesus said. Uh, they're, Jesus is out there teaching. He's been doing it uh, for a while, and all these people hear about him, and they start coming, and they want to hear what he has to say. Uh, so here they come. Jesus sees them. So he decides, you know what? I need a break. So he goes up on the side of the mountain. And the disciples follow him up on the side of the mountain. So get that picture. There's all these people down in the valley, uh, down below the mountain. And here are the disciples, and Jesus is up there, and they're above all these people. Well, Jesus uses this as a teaching moment to help them understand what they're supposed to do and who they're supposed to be. Basically, it was a visual. Hey, guys, all these people, they're coming here for a lot of different reasons. Some of them just want things from me to make their life better. It has nothing to do with God or anything else. They're coming here for all different reasons. Hey, these are the people that you were sent to reach, the people of the world. That's basically the theme and understanding of just seeing them about who they were supposed to be. So what does he do? He basically says, to do it, these are the attitudes you have to have. He called them the B attitudes. And I want to read them uh, to you again uh, once again this week. It said this, Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus brings attention to them. It's like, dude, guys, it's not about your reward here. It's about the reward in heaven. It's not about living for the approval of people here. And he talked about being persecuted and insulted and all this. It's not about living for the approval here. It's not about measuring your life with their personalities, their abilities, their passion, whatever it is. It's about being with God for eternity. Y'all, when we get that, it changes our attitude, doesn't it? And then he begins to talk to them about the attitude that they're had. There to have. Now, I shared with you the first two last week, and I want to recap those first two, and then I'm going to share with you uh, the third and fourth attitude today. So let's look again at the attitudes. Attitude number one is, I need God. I need God. That's the attitude. I want you to say it with me. I need God. Say it one more time. I need God. And we need to say it that way. Why would we say that? It's because we're in a condition where we know the other things don't fulfill the needs. In the scripture, it says this, verse 3, Jesus told them or taught them, blessed are the poor. Everybody say the word poor. Poor. Blessed are the poor. You may want to circle that word again. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When he's talking about being poor in spirit, he's talking about being lacking. That word poor literally means that, to be lacking, that we need something and we lack having it. And he says to be poor in spirit. So, we're lacking something in our heart. We're lacking something in our spirit. We know we need something that is not there. I shared with you uh, about children, and when we're born, uh, that we have a couple of different needs. One of those needs is for affection. All of us have the need for that. That's why it's so important for uh, when we have babies to caress babies and to spend time holding babies. They have that desire for affection. But we also have a desire for esteem. Now, we don't see that when babies are babies, right? But as they get older and older, we see that they have this desire to be seen as important. They have this desire to find things in their life that they feel like will make them important, and they begin taking control in many ways of their life because we're created to make decisions, right? So they get older, and they start choosing other things to make themselves feel better about who they are. That's just how it happens in life. In fact, that's how we move away from God. We start off early, right? We start off early with this affection, this affection that we want uh, touching, we want relationships, and we move as we get older from, we're moving away from affection, affection to esteem, esteem. I want people to see me as important. I want people to see me in a certain way. I want people's approval in my life. This is what happens. We use things of the world to try to get it. We buy things, we do this, we, whatever. But then we're lacking I shared this with you last week. Why? Because none of those things love you back. Right? God created us for affection and for esteem. And our esteem is not in those things. It's being loved by God. Y'all, this stuff will preach today, will it not? For a second time it will, all right? That's who we're supposed to be. And that's how we're to see ourselves. So we get to the point where I'm lacking, I'm poor in spirit. I finally have gotten to the place where I need the affection and not the esteem and the way I'm trying to get it. The second attitude I talked about was this, that I, I care about people, that I care about people. It's our caring that brings change into the world. I read a, another statement by Marion Wright Edelman, and she, made the, she said this, she wrote this, you really can change the world if you care enough. You really can't change the world if you care enough. What we know is that the only way the world changes is if we care enough. So I have to have the attitude that I care about people. I care about people. Say that. I care about people. Say it again. I care about people. Shouldn't that be our attitude? I need God. I care about people. Do you know why? Because God cares about us. In the scripture, it said this in verse 4, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. The people who are mourn are going through struggles in their life. They need things. They need, oh, this is sweet, affection. Don't you love it when things connect together, right? They need affection. 
They need comfort. And he's saying, blessed are those people that way, that are receiving this comfort. But what we know is as we care about people, as God cares about us, there are people who are mourning around us, and we need to show compassion to them. We need to comfort them. We need to be people who are showing affection to those people around us. Those are the people who mourn. And we learned about this and how it all works. It, it starts when we begin feeling this way and caring about people. We, we learn, first of all, it causes us to be compassionate, that we really want to protect them and want the best for them. If you're last week, you'll remember that part of it because I talked about the rat in our toilet. Anybody remember from last week, the rat in our toilet? Very big spiritual moment in the message last week. Uh, I just, there was a rat in the toilet. Jennifer saw it in there. It was, it was making these noises. She yells, Tim, come save me. She didn't say save me, but there's a rat in the toilet. She had dropped the lid. So what I did, I saw the, lid, the rat in the toilet. So what I decided to do is close the lid and flush the toilet. Of course, the rat is going to go down the toilet. I open it, and the rat was like this. It would not go down. So, of course, the solution was, as you learned last week, to protect Jennifer. I closed the toilet and put a bunch of books on it and prayed that the rat would go away basically what I did, and it did go away the next day. You're doing something to protect the rat. Oh, by the way, some of you, that's the only thing you remember about last week. That's just it. It's about the rat thing. Somebody this past week, I loved it because um, they, re they heard that part of it, and it was one of the best gifts that I've ever received in my life. They're here in the room today, by the way, who, who gave it to me. They gave me a rat trap with corks they put on it so it would float in the toilet. Isn't that great? I think I'm going to start marketing them. I think that's what I'm going to do. I think it'd be a, a great thing. I don't know why I said that. It's just a fun story again. Oh, yeah, because we care about people. We want to protect them, and we have compassion toward them. Okay, let me get away from that and move into the third attitude. Our compassion leads us to be sensitive, to be concerned, and then we help them. Okay, that's what we learn. Attitude number three, I will submit and be patient. And you're like, okay, where does it say that in the Scripture? Uh, verse 5, blessed are the meek, circle that word meek, blessed are the meek for they will inherit, circle the word inherit, will inherit the earth. Now the reason why I say it this way, I will submit and be patient is because the word meek means to submit and to be patient. Again, that's literally the definition of the word meek. I will submit and be patient. Now, the reason why these two are so critically important, now, these are attitudes that we have, right? Man, I'm, I have a submissive attitude. I have a patient type of attitude. The reason why these are so critically important is because we have to be this way to have the right influence on other people. You see, it's not just that we care about other people, but we want to influence other people. And to do it, I have to submit myself, and I have to be patient with the people around me. Now, the, the thing that's a little confusing about this scripture, it says that those people who are meek inherit the earth. And here we are spending time today saying you're not supposed to live for the things of the earth, right? I mean, that's, that's basically what we've been learning. We're not to do that. But you have to, to know and see the importance of that word inherit. We inherit the earth. We can look at examples of people in our society. Somebody wealthy has died. They leave a bunch of money. So people go to the reading of the will, and they find out what it is that they have been given. And there have been many occasions like that where they go, and there are people who are really disappointed. It's like, he gave this person so much money and all these things, and he didn't give me hardly anything. You know the reason why they do that a lot of times? Because they don't trust the person to give them a lot of stuff. They don't trust them to use it wisely. The person that they trust is the one that gets the biggest inheritance because they know they're going to carry on the legacy through what it is they're leaving. They believe they're going to do it because they've proven that they're responsible and will do it. They're the right kind of person to do it. You know, that's what God is trying to do, what Jesus is trying to teach us here. The people who are meek, the people who are submissive, the people who are patient with people, those are the people that I'm going to trust in this world to make the biggest difference. They will inherit the inheritance of the world to lead people to God, to be the leaders of the world, to lead people to trust in him. Now, that's a strong statement, isn't it? But we got to submit and we have to be patient. Those are the keys. Look at the definitions of those two words. Uh, actually, these, all these things are already written on your outline sheet because this is what happened. Last week, I, I got through point number three in the early service, 
and I didn't make it in this service, so I went ahead and filled it in. So it's a blessing to you that you don't have to write it. So here it is again. The word submit uh, means this, to subject oneself to some kind of influence. So when I, I submit myself to this influence, all right, so I, that's how I do it. So I'm allowing somebody to influence me. And the other word is this, patience. It's persevering while waiting for a desired result. So I persevere, this patience, while I'm waiting for something that I really want. Now, let me give you more description of that through the two statements underneath it, because this is how we're supposed to be. These are the type of people that, that God trusts or, or Christ trusts uh, for the inheritance. I need to be influenced. Let me say it this way. I need to be influenced. You know, many times we're thinking about, we got to influence other people. It's a time out. Before I influence other people, I need to be influenced. That's the word submit. I don't know it all. Therefore, I need to submit to those who know more. And there are people around us who know more. First of all, we're to submit to God, obviously. We're to submit to Jesus and what he says to us. Listen to this. We're to submit to people who are like Christ, right? who are Christ-like, who are more Christ-like in areas that we are not. We are to submit to people who have the same gift that we have but are a lot better at using that gift than we are. That's submission. Instead, people in their pride say, I know it all, I don't need anything or whatever. God didn't trust us to, to lead or encourage people in that way. We have to submit to be influenced. And then there's the other one, I need to, in, I need to influence. Okay, first of all, I need to be influenced, and now I need to influence. And here's how you influence. It's through your patience. When I patiently wait on the right time for others, I reveal that I care about who they are and what they need to succeed. It's not about them doing things in my timing, because if I do that, I'm saying it's about me and what I want instead of being willing to wait so that they can get what they need. It's success. So when you look at your life and you say, man, I really don't submit. I never listen to people. I never do anything. It's, a, it's an attitude problem. The other thing is if I'm constantly getting impatient with people, we are not the type of people and character that God can use to bring change in the world. All right, uh, number four. This will be the last one. I am weak when I am wrong. I am weak when I am wrong. Say that with me. I am weak when I am wrong. That needs to be our attitude. I, I understand this about myself, that I am weak when I am wrong. Now, remember, as we went back again to the introduction of the message, when I talked to you about synergy, it had to do with two things, direction and strength. And I am, I am weak. I don't have the ability to influence the right way when I am wrong. I am weak because I'm not living the way I should be in certain areas of my life. So I need to have the attitude that I will change. It's all about being made right. Look at what Jesus said, verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Circle the word right in the word righteousness. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. We need to do the right things for the good of others. It's, you know, it's easy for us to do the wrong things. Uh, Jennifer, really, I appreciate this so much that she said this to me. It's been, I don't know, three months ago now, something like that. Uh, but there is something that I'd been doing, really, in the house. It was very selfish. Of course, I didn't think of it that way. It's just whatever. Because uh, I'm never wrong, okay? But that's the, I really do well on the previous attitude, obviously, okay? Uh, but no, I, I mean, there are things that I, I was doing. And there's something that happened to us. It's been, we've been in the place that we live now maybe three years. All of our kids got married. They moved out. So we moved into a condo so they wouldn't move back in with us. Right? I've talked to you about that before. Uh, so anyway, now it's awesome being in a condo because there's no yard work. And I had the responsibility of the yard work. So now I don't have any responsibility because Jennifer did most of this stuff inside. Well, for some reason, she doesn't agree with this. So this is what I would do. I would eat, okay, and I would have a dirty plate, and I would, this was, I thought, a very good thing. I would take the dirty plate off at the table, and then I would walk into the kitchen, and I would place it on top of where the dishwasher was. You know, isn't that nice to get it closer to the dishwasher? And one day she looked at me and said, Tim, I don't understand how you can get it that far and not put it in the dishwasher. And conviction came upon me. I, I'm serious. It's like, did she just yell at me? Was she mad at me when she said that? Or, and she wasn't. She just brought it 
to an attention, it's like, can't you just do a little bit more? Can't you do just a little bit more? And y'all now, guess what? I learned how to operate the dishwasher. <laughs> yeah, I even know where the things go when they come out of the dishwasher. I don't really necessarily have to put them there, but I know there are times that I do, obviously, to try to help out. That's not a right thing that I was doing. It was wrong. Because when I'm doing something wrong, it's, I was communicating a message to her that she's not worth me putting a plate in the dishwasher. I mean, how rude is that? People have feelings, and we need to care about pe people. These, even the littlest weaknesses cause people to be influenced in a negative way. So what does this look like? Let's get into it. It's, it uses the word hunger and thirst. These are important words as well. The word hunger means this, painful. Uh, it's a painful sensation or state of weakness. That's what we're talking about, right? It's a painful sensation or state of weakness caused by the need for food or the need for something else. Uh, some of y'all, I mean, there have been times that you've been really, really, really hungry, and you know what this means, what this is like, and, you know, I just really, I need some food, I need some food, and most people in this room don't know what that's like at all, to be in that place where people truly experience hunger. I mean, when you see people in this state, it's like, it's so incredible to see people going through this, and y'all, they're going through pain. So what Jesus is saying is this. It's a blessing if you get to the point where you are in pain because you have not been doing the right things. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. I'm in pain because I haven't been doing the right thing, and I need to change. That word thirst means this. It means uh, to eagerly desire it. So I'm in pain because I'm going through this, and I eagerly desire for this to go away. How can I figure this out? And this is what Jesus did. In another place, in John chapter 6, listen to what he said. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. He just told us how not to be hungry and how to quench our thirst. How we're not hungry is to stop living for ourselves things that we think will satisfy and to look to the one that we need. The way we quench our thirst is to believe in him. It's not enough to know that I'm in pain and that I need this. We must believe in him to quench our thirst. Some people are hungry and they're thirsty. So how do we live a right life? Because the, the statement, the attitude was this, I am weak when I am wrong. All right, so how, and it's because I'm doing the wrong things. How do I do the right things? I just want to give you one statement that clarifies what righteousness is. And it's just looking at Jesus' life. Just one statement. Okay, here it is. Everything he did, I'm talking about Jesus. Everything he did, he did for the good of others. And that's why he was right in everything that he did. Y'all, is that awesome or what? I mean, let's just bring it down to where it is. Everything he did, he did for the good of others. So am I, if I say this, am I saying what I'm saying for the good of others? If I do what I do, am I doing that for the good of someone else? Is that what I'm doing? Well, if we have been wrong and weak, we need to be taking instruction into our minds. Why? Because our mind is what controls our attitude. We learned that from the definition of attitude. We need to begin taking things into our mind that lead us to change. And that's these last three statements, and, and we'll be done, okay? I need right instruction. If I want to do this, I need to start listening to something or someone that's going to lead me to change. And that right instruction is the instruction about uh, the instruction from Jesus. Y'all, again, I love it when things come together. All right, here it is. Jesus is on the side of the mountain giving them instruction. Isn't that what he's doing? 
He's saying these are the attitudes that you're supposed to have, and you better look at your attitude to see if you have one of these, because if you do, you're going to be in trouble, and you're not going to influence the world. We need to hear what he was saying. Did you know that today this is happening in this room today? That we're bringing this instruction into our mind? But the next thing that we need to do is this. We have to have the right thoughts about it. I need to be thinking about it. Not only am I listening to it and reading it, but I need to think about what it is that I have just read and heard. And when I say that, I use the word I because I need to think about how It affects me. I need to think about how I am related to my attitude because this is personal. I don't need to be worried about the person sitting next to me or somebody. It starts with me. What is my attitude? And when we have the right attitude, it leads to the right action. That's the last statement. It leads to the right action. Do you know why? Here's why. Because you have learned that everything that Jesus does, he does for good. You begin thinking about that, and our thoughts cause us to form beliefs that this is true. You know, I've been lacking because I haven't been living that way, because I haven't been doing everything for the good of people. I've been doing things for the good of myself, and you know what? It's caused me pain, and I am thirsty for something different. I am thirsty for something different. And because my life and my heart has changed, I will do what I do for the good of others. It's all about your attitude. So what's your attitude? 